My name is Grant McAllister. I'm a senior principal engineer with AWS. Uh, today we're going to be talking about Aurora. We're going to do a deep dive into some of the technology and architecture that we use. Uh, and we're going to talk about the innovations that architecture leads to and the things we've done over the last year. So what is Amazon Aurora? The really, you know, the, the quick bullet is this is our cloud native database. So we've taken the best of open source MySQL and Postgres, and we've added the things that enterprises wanted to see and really build it on top of what we do um, with, with the rest of AWS. So there's a lot of features. I'm not going to go through them all today because a lot of people have seen this slide. I want to jump right into the architecture. So when we talk about architecture for Aurora, one of the first things to understand is it's, it's regional in that it runs across a region. The storage is across three availability zones. So here I'm depicting in the blue sort of this virtual storage layer you get when you ask to provision a cluster. And the gray boxes are the storage nodes. Now I'm showing nine, but typically you might have 100 or 1,000 supporting a very large volume, a very large cluster, right? So when you provision an instance for Aurora, you get the first instance is going to be a read-write node. And your application can connect to that and do reads and writes. When it does write, it's going to write six copies of the log records down to storage. And so I've kind of had those colored differently for the different segments. So we divide this storage up into 10 gig segments. So those segments essentially are mirrored across those six copies. So in the case of one of those storage servers going down, it's fine. We need four of six of those writes to complete before we give an acknowledgment back to the client that we're durable, right? So this way we can continue to writing even if we have an AZ outage. But one of the things that's interesting about this architecture is when we do reads, we actually only read from one copy. We don't need a quorum read. We actually keep track of where we are from a sequence number perspective so that we know that the storage node is up to date and we can just return from one of them. And usually we read from the local one because that's going to be lower latency. Now, in the case, let's say, one of those four or six writes doesn't make it down to storage and you've got a, a segment that has a missing write, we do peer-to-peer -peer gossip replication between them and we catch up via one of the other segments. And if the whole storage node fails, we'll just reparent and recopy the whole storage to another server. And of course, for high availability, you want some place to fail over to, or you just want to do reads in another uh, instance for scale. We allow read-only nodes, or replicas, uh, as we call them. And the interesting thing, again, about Aurora is that we don't duplicate the storage when you have a replica. We just read from the clustered storage. Now, to do this, though, you're, that read-only node has memory, right? It has buffer cache. It needs to be kept up to date. Well, it could do that by trying to figure out what's changing in storage, but instead what we do is we send messages from the read-write node to the read-only node, asynchronously invalidating and keeping the memory up to date so that you can query. And there's just like a you know, sub -mil you know, few milliseconds lag in a lot of cases. Uh, so this is quite good. Now, of course, you can have up to 15 RO nodes. I show a whole bunch here in one AZ, but you can mix and match and do whatever configuration works for you. One of the other nice features is each of these instances can be different sized or different instance families. Now, we kind of recommend that you have the same ones for failover, but if you had like a read application, you can have something different. So I'm showing an R6G 4XL on the one side. That's our Graviton 2 processor. In the middle, I have the new 6i, which are the new Intel versions, and they go up to 32XL now, so a very, very large machine that has great scale on Aurora. And then on the other far side, we have db.serverless. And this is our serverless v2 option. So you can mix and match different instance sizes and different instance families all in one cluster. And it all works great. Now, what happens when you continue to grow? You might need more storage. Well, guess what? Aurora automatically grows that storage for you. You don't have to do anything here up to 128 terabytes. If you have a failure in like either a node fails or an AZ has a problem, we will fail over to one of the read-only nodes. And it's, it's all ready to go. This usually takes you know, 30 seconds for the DNS to propagate. So that's what I'm showing is that Route 53 is there because your application is going to have to know about it. But we have now a new addition. We have an AWS wrapper for the JDBC driver, for the standard Postgres JDBC driver. And we have a MySQL driver that will cache all the information about the cluster so that we don't actually need to go to Route 53 when we're doing failovers. So this significantly reduces that gap time because we're no longer waiting for the propagation of that information. So this is a nice addition to our high availability story. So that's for kind of one cluster, right, in one region. If you need multi-region, 
we have global database. And what I'm showing here is region A, region B. These could be whichever two pair of regions you'd like to imagine. And on region A, I have a standard setup, my production primary sort of cluster. And when I enable global database. And what we get is storage for that cluster in region B. And we get these new two items called a replication server and a replication agent. And you don't actually see these. These are just behind the scenes. But this is storage-based replication. So that's subtly different than a lot of other replications. So when you go to do writes, we actually have this multi-path communication. So because remember, we're doing things at the block and segment level, we can actually do this fully in parallel. So we don't have to have a single stream of replication. So when you do a write on your read-write node, it's going to flow to all the normal places, like the read-only and the local storage. But it also goes to the replication server, right? And the replication server can then forward that to the replication agent in the new region and then to the storage server over there. And at that point, you have DR, right? You've got your storage. Now, this is asynchronous, but it's got a fairly low lag. But you may also want to read the data in that region. So you can just fire up a read-only node, right? And then the only real difference is, is now that replication agent is also sending those, those uh, changes to update the memory on the read-only node. And of course, if you want to have a fully mirrored configuration, you can create a system that looks exactly the same as your production one, right? So this is a nice way to have full uh, protection. Now, we also do storage to storage based replication for some of our catch up. So we can, we can do that without talking to any of the head nodes. So again, this is a nice property of the storage system. In the case of a failure of a region, or if you just need to, you can promote region B to a primary cluster, right? And that's a pretty simple command. And what it does is it just enables this cluster to be a standalone cluster. But it leaves the original cluster there, uh, and it doesn't rejoin or do anything. It's just promoting one of the clusters. So this works from sort of an emergent kind of situation if you need to fail over now. But our customers were like, well, we don't always do it emergently. Could you give us a better option? So we introduced managed planned failover. So this is when you want to test your DR. Or let's say you just need to, you've decided to move to a different region because that's closer to your customers. So in this case, we have the exact same configuration. But what we're going to do is call the failover global cluster command. And what that's going to do is stop the writes on the primary cluster in region A. And then we're going to verify that all the replication has happened so that we have the exact same data on both sides. So we have zero data loss. And then we're going to flip over to the new cluster, right? So this looks a lot like promote, doesn't it? You're in there. You've got a new read write in region B, right? But what's nice about this command is now we rewire and re-enable the original cluster to be now the follower uh, in or secondary cluster back in the original region. So you're back having your full DR set up with just you know, one set of commands. So that's really nice. And of course, global DB is not limited to just replicating to one region. So here I'm showing just replicating to region B. I could have region C that has a slightly different configuration, right? This one would be using serverless as an example. Or region D that doesn't have any instances and is just there to make sure the storage is being replicated. So you have lots of options. You can have up to five regions that you replicate to. One of the other really nice features that we enabled that I originally was kind of unsure about was write forwarding. So if you have an application that's writing, and I've kind of highlighted the one in pink that's doing the writing right now, and you've got this code, and someone says, well, can't I run that in region B? Like, I just want to deploy the same code everywhere. Well, unfortunately, if you try to write in region B, that write's going to fail because it, the cluster is read only. So you'd have to make special, you'd have to change that application to say, forward those writes back to the original region, set up a VPN tunnel. It's a lot of work, right? Definitely doable. But instead, what you can do now is you can enable global write forwarding on an instance by instance basis. And so what this allows now is that application to actually do a write on that read-only node, and we'll forward it over to the read-write node. And then it becomes a regular write that flows back in the exact same ways that you would see uh, a regular write that would have happened. Now, the interesting thing about this is you have two options here for reading, because you could read right after your write, and if you do the default setting, you're not going to see your write. But you can also say, I would like to wait till my write propagates back through, as it has now. And then you're going to get read your write consistency. So then your application doesn't have to deal with any weird consistency problems. So you can literally deploy this 
the exact same code in both regions. Now, there are some caveats. You know, if you're 99% right, this is probably not the best architecture, right? But if you've got a high read application with a little bit of writes, this is a wonderful solution to make things simpler for everyone in your team. Let's dive a little bit into the internals of how Aurora works uh, at the storage layer and writing. So on the left, I have Postgres, standard Postgres. On the right, I'm showing Aurora. So when you go do an update, you have your block in memory, and I'm showing the original tuple there. You get a new tuple or new row, and that gets sent to the log stream, right? But you also get this thing called a full block or full page image in Postgres. And this is really about some guts for, for durability reasons that I'll explain in a second. But it's the first time after a checkpoint that you modify a block, it's Postgres is gonna do this. So at some point you do another update, but now you haven't done a checkpoint, so you only have to do the log vector to wall, right? So this is all the regular Postgres stuff. At some point you're gonna run a checkpoint, you're gonna to have to send that block to storage, so you do that right. You're gonna archive the wall out, and so that's another write that has to happen. And then that has to be read and sent to S3 or you know, your equivalent backup stuff. Um, this is just regular Postgres, works really well. One of the things to note, right, is Postgres has 8K block sizes by default, but Linux is 4K. So when you do those writes on your checkpoint, there's a chance that the machine might crash in the middle. And then you'd end up with a split or torn block because you don't actually have a complete consistent block, right? So this is the reason why the full block logging exists. So that on recovery, Postgres will just grab that block and replace it, and then you have no corruption, right? So this is great, it works really well, but you can see that there's a lot of writing going on. On post, oh, and because all that writing happens, we end up with a lot of data in our walls, right, in our logs. And so when Postgres crashes, it'll take a, a number of minutes, and the more wall you're doing between checkpoints, the longer that's going to be. On, on Aurora, we don't do the same work. When we do an update, all we're sending is the log record down to storage, right? So every time we do an update, just the log record, right? No checkpointing, no full page writes. We still have to you know, back up the data from the storage system, but in general, it's a different architecture. We're coalescing those log records into blocks down at the storage, and I'll show that in a little more detail. But because it's continuous and it's parallel, it's done ahead of time. So if there's a crash, there's no crash recovery to be done. It's just a couple of seconds, right? And of course, we back up the blocks and the logs to S3 so that you have backups as well, right? In MySQL, it's almost exactly the same, but they have a slightly different mechanism to prevent torn writes. Um, we have our updates, they just go to the log. When we do a checkpoint, um, we end up doing this thing called the double write buffer. So it's a one meg buffer where we write out a whole bunch of blocks sequentially, and then once that's done, we go write the data file. And of course, we have to archive the log, same as on Postgres, and those all need to be backed up. Again, there's a difference between the block size, 16K, and the Linux one, and so again, you can get torn writes, but what uh, MySQL does is it just uses that full block and the double write buffer if this happens so you can resolve corruption. So again, same thing on, you get the recovery time that's gonna be long because the log is still there and needs to be recovered on crash. Um, on Aurora, you don't have any of those issues, right? No checkpointing, no double write buffer, Again, so we're doing a lot less work in Aurora. So let's go down and look at that storage node. What's going on in that storage node? So we have a lot of different components, but let's have a read-write node. Let's say it wants to do, it's gonna send down a write. Um, piece A, or you know, vector A is coming in, and it comes to the incoming queue. So that incoming queue is only in memory. So we can't act this back because it's not durable. So we wait until it moves to the hot log, and this is our persistent disk location. So it's still just an ordered log of the things we've received. So we can act it back. And then we get another request coming through, C. It comes to the incoming queue, and then it goes down to the hot log, so this all looks fine. But we know the ordering of things, and so we'll know that, notice that like, we're actually missing B. And so we can actually ask the peer, give us B. And then now we have the nice full set of ordered transactions that apply to that block. So we can move them to the update queue, and from the update queue, we essentially can then coalesce those into a block, right? So it does whatever updates are necessary, and now you have a full block. So then when you do a read in Postgres, in Aurora or MySQL, 
we're not doing anything weird with the code. We're just reading a block, just like you would do in any of the standard databases. And of course, what we do is we take those logs from the hot log and the blocks that are coalesced, and we back those up. And we don't actually, when we say we do a snapshot, it's not the traditional snapshot. It's not grabbing all the blocks at once and sending them to S3. What we're doing is we're continuously doing this, and then we keep track of where they are, and we just have uh, metadata about what a snapshot points to. So this means it's continuous as opposed to a one-time big operation, right? Our storage also has some great ability to, to scale up and scale down. So to show this, I have a little uh, application where I was creating a partition and filling it every hour, and I was gonna have 24 partitions, so I do that, and I get up to about 160 gig on my working, right? And then all the next hours, I'm just creating and dropping a partition, so my storage doesn't get any larger, right? So this is a nice application, it's not gonna grow too much, but then we have a flash sale, right? And our storage jumps up by a whole bunch in two hours, up to 300 gig. Now, we know this is gonna go away, right? Because we're gonna drop those partitions 24 hours later. Great, right? So at the end of the time, the blue line is the used space inside the database. And so databases, the way they work is if you truncate or drop a table, right, your partition, you're gonna get the space back. So that works really well. But with traditional databases, the space in the data files and the volume would still be in use. So you wouldn't get that space back, right? And it would be used and not available. But what Aurora does is it actually gets rid of this two extra, well, in this case, a two extra uh, storage cost by shrinking the storage right after we do that drop. So it's an asynchronous process. It doesn't happen immediately, but it does in the background. It will collect those unused pieces of your storage and return them. So then your costs go down and the size of your database goes down. So you don't really have to worry about the elastic nature of both scale up or scale down when it comes to storage. One of the features I really like about the storage is it enables things like cloning, right? So in this case, we have a feature called fast clones. So if I had a reporting application where I wanted to run a bunch of different reports and I might want to build some indexes and some summaries, I don't necessarily want to do that against production. What I can do is I can start my reporting application and I can ask for a clone of my current database. So we'll get you a read-write instance and we'll get you some clone storage. Let's say this is a 40 terabyte database, right? That would have been very co costly to you know, do a restore and create another 40 terabytes, you'd be paying for that. With the clone, you're not paying for any storage until you modify it. So it's really a virtual pointer at the start to your existing cluster storage, right? So when you go and start doing activities, like you do a read, even though it looks like we're reading from the clone storage, that pointer gets us back to the original storage and we just read that block. When we do a write, we need to separate these because they're not the same cluster. We'll do copy on write and we'll break that link. So at that point, you have, you've started now having your own distinct copies of blocks and you're gonna incur some cost, but you notice it's a fraction of the whole storage, right? Um, if you create some of your own things, like you create your own index, those won't touch the original storage at all, right? And if the original cluster starts creating new blocks, they're not replicated, because these are not a replicated system. If they're distinct, right? And if the read-write, the current cluster, also changes an existing block, we will separate those linkages again and make, make sure we have a copy locally in the clone so that we, we can continue, right? So these are separate items, but it's very fast to do this. The question I usually get is, what kind of impact does this have on performance? Because you now got multiple things touching the same storage. So to demonstrate this, I did a PG bench, a uh, scale 10,000, that's set up to do 20,000 transactions per second, so a reasonable amount of work. And so about 19 minutes in, I run the clone command, and you'll see that there's no degradation in the performance, right? And then the clone, I think it took like 10 or 12 minutes or something to create, and then I restarted, I started a new PG bench on the cloned copy, and that's what you see in the sort of uh, uh, orangish line there. And again, there is no change to the performance of that system, right? Because in the background, we will make sure from a storage perspective that we're scaling the storage nodes to, to handle these clones and how much work is happening. Now, the clone feature then leads to some other interesting features. Today, you can do export of RDS or Aurora to S3, but that's done via snapshot. So if you have the current, if we look at the current one, when you ask us to do this, we'll take a snapshot of the storage and then we'll restore that snapshot to a new cluster, right? And that has to come, we have to hydrate from S3 to that cluster. And that's gonna take a while depending on the size of your, your storage, right? 
And then once that's done, we'll fire up an instance, and then we can extract the data and put it in S3, right? So this is a logical dump to S3. This gets you like a parquet or a CSV format to, to, to S3. But with clones, you don't have to wait that long. What we can do is we can just create a clone in Aurora, and then we can immediately start extracting data. Now, if you're running on MySQL, we actually have a parallel export feature, so we can do it even faster. So this allows us to dump a lot of data very quickly in S3 for a lot of different uh, CDC uh, things, and you'll see an example of this a little bit later. So let's talk a little bit about what's changed in MySQL over the last year. So we introduced MySQL, Aurora MySQL 3.0 version, which is basically our 8.0 uh, compatible version. Uh, but it, when, we re when we released it, it didn't actually support a uh, major version upgrade. It now does. So you can upgrade from 5.7 to 8 now. So that's you know, obviously good. Uh, we've added IPC, IPv6 support across all the range of Aurora and RDS instances. We also had a lot of requests for Active Directory, so we now support that. Um, the parallel export I already talked about. And the next one I want to talk about is enhanced bin log. So bin log is essentially the MySQL format for logical replication. And it works really well. It's been around forever. It's how they've, they've, they've done it for since I started using MySQL back in the four days. Um, but you can see at the top there, MySQL is a little interesting because it has its standard logging that you know, goes to things like InnoDB, and that's in the blue. And it generates those as you're going along and doing your transaction. And when it's ready to commit, it does a prepare on those, and then it generates the bin log information. And then once that's done, it commits it all together. But you can see the sequencing spreads out, right? So this can have a really large effect, like might reduce your throughput by 80%. Uh, you know, on worst case, or 50%, or even 10, 20%, whatever. But it, it definitely impacts your performance when you enable bin log. Now, on Aurora, you don't need bin log by default versus on a regular database you do. So a lot of customers didn't have bin log on, but they want to use logical replication. So then they turn it on, and we have a performance impact. So given that we have storage systems that understand the database and what's going on with it, we could actually make changes. So that's what the enhanced bin log is doing we can now actually safely generate both the bin log and the regular log changes at the same time so that the commit can happen sooner and, take, and have less latency. So the good thing about this is it greatly reduces the overhead on the head node when you turn on bin log. But the other cool feature is that we can do direct extraction from storage of this enhanced bin log information, which then reduces the overhead for when you're actually wanting to send that CDC data somewhere else. So that's, you know, we'll see, we'll see an example of that in a minute. Um, the Postgres updates for this year are also <laughs> quite a good set of them. So the first one is that we updated to support Postgres 14, uh, a lot of new features in 14, very nice release, and we also got a couple new extensions with it. And of course, Postgres produces a major version every year, right? So you can have a lot of them, um, which is challenging when it comes to major version upgrades. So now we have what we call multi-major version upgrade. It's quite a little. What a nice little name there. So you can go directly from something like 11 to 14, 12 to 14, so you can jump over the in-between ones and you don't have to upgrade serially through them. So that saves you a lot of time when you're doing major version upgrades and it makes it a lot simpler. We had Scram authentication added a, a while back, but there wasn't enforcement. Now you can actually say, I want people only to use Scram, not to use MD5, so enhancing the security of your system. Uh, already talked about IPv6. Um, we added ZDP support, our zero downtime patching, uh, in the last couple of releases, but we just made a, a, another set of changes in this last set of releases to also bring the consistency of time down for larger uh, volumes on when we do those upgrades. So that should mean faster upgrades for minor and patch one. And we had a feature that we did for Aurora MySQL a while back where we improved the uh, read replica availability used to be that if the writer went down, the readers would also have to restart. Uh, we fixed that for Aurora MySQL, and I'm very happy that we've now fixed that for Aurora Postgres now, so readers will not restart when the writer does. And most recently, we've added the support for a logical replication cache, and I want to go through that uh, briefly. So if you've got your users, you've got your Aurora database, and you have something that you want to feed logical information, like DMS as an example. So when you do an insert, that goes to your Aurora Postgres instance, and it's going to write both the regular log and the information necessarily to do uh, logical decoding, which is essentially a form of the wall log, right? 
Um, so this is important that we have to write both of these to storage at the same time because if we didn't and we just cached, let's say, the, the red stuff, if that server crashes, you're going to have an interruption in your logical replication. You're going to be missing part of the feed, and that'd be pretty bad, right? So we persist this to disk, and when you want to do the extraction with a logical decoder, the challenge is we have to read this back from storage. So this is slower, obviously, higher latency, but it also adds cost because you're doing reads from Aurora, right? So our customers like, we would like this to be better. So um, to get that to work better, what we did was we built a cache. So this is a write-through cache. So all the writes still go in the exact same way that I showed before, but they're also going to that cache. So now the logical decoder is just reading from that. So we see a dramatic improvement in the ability to catch up, to speed up, to handle more uh, concurrent logical replication decoders. So this is a really nice if you're using uh, logical decoding on Postgres. So one of the other features we announced uh, this week is our trusted language extensions for Postgres. And this is for both Aurora and, and RDS Postgres. We currently support 85 extensions across those engines. So that's a reasonable number. But for those of you that know Postgres, there's thousands of them out there, right? Um, and some companies build their own. It's, a, it's fairly challenging, right? And most extensions are written in C, which means they have a lot of power because they can interact at a very low level with the Postgres code. But it also means that they're very scary because they can do things that would compromise the reliability of the server, the data, the high availability. So we, when we you know, add an extension to RDS or Aurora Postgres, we have to do a lot of vetting to make sure that they're safe, right? But this means that the time to do that takes a long time, and there's a limited number because you know, it's a lot of work. So with this new extension model that's going to be available in 14.5 and above, um, it's called TLE, and it's a framework so that you can build new extensions with trusted languages, but that have some of the capabilities that you would see in a C language. The other nice thing is it's packaged in a way that you can load your own extension into Aurora or RDS. You don't have to wait for us to, to put the code in. And this is an open source project, so we're really hoping that from a community basis, this will be something that will be picked up and become a, a new standard. So why do a specific you know, trusted language extension? Well, again, as I said, the C stuff is a little scary. It's also very complex to write in C and do it correctly. So the trusted languages are nice because they're not going to have problems with like memory or other things. Um, but the challenge has always been if you use a trusted language, you didn't have access to these internal Postgres APIs. Um, and now, some of them you wouldn't want access to because, again, they would, could cause issues. But there are ones like there's a password hook, as an example. So if you wanted to check the complexity of your password, right? And that's one of the examples we ship with the, in the open source project. You couldn't do that before with a trusted language. With the TLE framework, you can now build that extension yourself. And it's going to be safe, but still allow you to have that functionality. So how does this work? You can use JavaScript. In our case, that's PLV8. Perl, Tickle, PLPG SQL, and we're hoping to add Rust because a lot of folks would like, you know, the performance of that is quite good. Um, so what you do is you end up creating your function in TLE, right? So this is, you can have your hooks and all your other code, and then you essentially make that into an extension. That extension can be installed by the customer who has create extension capabilities, right? So this all can be done from by the customer, right? Doesn't need RDS or Aurora to help you with that. And the thing I really like about this model is once the customer is using this, and let's say they find some issues, they can immediately give feedback to whoever wrote that, and that person can generate a new you know, version of that function, and they can ship it again, and you have this very quick cycle time, right? So it's like writing a standard you know, sort of trusted language, but having way more power with it. So that's something, as I said, we're, we're really excited. Hopefully, we'll allow the expansion of the, you know, the power of Postgres in a safe way. One of the other areas around manageability that I want to talk about is our new serverless offering, and you know, sometimes said called serverless v2. I'm trying to now just call it serverless. Um, it's our on-demand, pay-as-you-go, at a one-second basis, scale up and scale down database. The nice thing is the new architecture is very similar to our current provision system, has all the same capabilities, but has these new uh, really nice capabilities to go with it. Now, 
the common thing that folks think about when they think of serverless is pairing that with a serverless application. So I've shown that here, right? I've got a Lambda application, you know, high level, I've got an Aurora database, right? But in the details, what we really see is that you have, uh, you have many Lambda functions, right? And you have a database. So when you first start calling that, you may not have a lot of activity. And that database has a certain amount of CPU and RAM. And as you add more functions that do more work, you may need more CPU, more RAM. We'll scale it up, again, on a one-second basis. And let's say you add a reporting one that does a lot more work, right? We'll again scale that up. And then when all that's done, we'll scale back down, right? So this is a natural thing if you've got this kind of serverless application to use serverless for, right? But the question I get a lot is, OK, so that's, it's good, really good at that. But is it, is it good at doing standard workloads, right, that we've been running forever on our database? And the answer is yes. And I wanted to show an, a sort of a challenging example of that and why serverless really does help. So I built this benchmark. It's based on like the sysbench, uh, you know, basic uh, benchmarking, but it has a lot of kind of interesting twists to it that you'll see as we go through it. So I kind of have a day to night curve. I didn't actually run it for 24 hours because, you know, I, I didn't want to wait that long for my benchmark, but it does run for eight hours and you can see it curves up and goes down at night. And then I have a batch job that sort of runs in the last couple hours there, right? And let's look at this. So, this is the PI dashboard that I've just kind of blown up here. And if we look at the top, we see that CPU is it's kind of high, but it's still OK. Like, it's not anywhere near, like, you know, 75 or 100. Um, and if we look at the load averages, again, this looks pretty OK, right? Like, we, we still have CPU to spare, right? Now, we know that maybe there's something weird going on over here that we probably should drill into and see what's, what's happening. But let's first concentrate on this little peak here, right? So these are one minute averages that I'm showing you. Well, summarized. Let's drill into the one second data, right? So the fun thing about the benchmark I built, it has a spike every two minutes for eight seconds, right? Variable. And what we see is we now actually are running more processes than we have CPUs, right? We only have 16 CPUs and we have 20 processes that are trying to do work. What this is going to mean if your application is latency sensitive is you're going to see latency problems during those eight seconds. But, you know, people are going to look and say, but the CPU is not at 100%. Like, why is it going on? The CPU is at 100%, but it's at 100% for eight seconds, right? So, you know, averages can lie. Um, now let's go look at what would happen if you're running serverless, right? So that was provision. This is serverless. So we have the same spike. Now, there's a little line there that says estimated vCPUs on the PI dashboard, and it's kind of a little odd because it doesn't get updated every second. So we might be scaling up or down, but it's not going to show that if it's really small, small scaling. So if I go look at CloudWatch and I look at my actual ACU percentage usage, what we see with serverless is we're actually scaling up for those eight seconds, right? We scale up by more than 8% of our overall budget. Um, but we don't have to do anything, right? Like, this is all handled. We have no increase in latency. This, you know, works just as you would expect it to. Now, you could have just got a much bigger box and provisioned, right? But then you'd be running idle most of the time. So this just shows how fast serverless can react. Now, let's drill into that, that batch workload over on the, on the side. So when we, when we go into a little more fine detail, right, what we see here is that, wow, yeah, the CPU is getting a little higher, but it's still not too bad. But the load, yeah, the load is definitely getting worrisome, right? Like, that's getting to a level where, man, this could be a problem. Um, and why is this? What's, what's the problem, right? Well, we're reading a lot. We're reading a lot of blocks that weren't in cache. That's where we're getting those wait events, right? Well, the side effect of that that I wanted to point out, so I did a point select query that's a canary that sort of shows, here's the latency if my app was doing, let's say, the primary purpose was to show that point select, right? This is the latency graph. When, when that batch job kicks in. And what we see is a 10x increase in the latency of that select, because instead of getting it from cache all the time, sometimes it's now getting it from disk, right? It's going to Aurora storage, because we, we didn't have enough cache. And in actuality, it's slightly worse than this, because if we, we zoom in again down to the one second metrics, guess what? Remember those spikes that were happening every two minutes? They're still happening, right? And so they're even being hidden here, where there's still having problems because we're, we don't possibly have enough CPU as well. We're running out of CPU and memory, right? So again, with serverless, what we see is a completely different model. 
So this, you can now see, because these are scale up that, take, that last for more than a few seconds, you see that we scale up the number of vCPUs. But we're doing more than that. We're scaling up the memory as well, right? So we're scaling the memory and CPU so that we're accommodating. And you'll see that we still have a little bit of blue there on the, on the screen, right? Because there's a slight period where we've enlarged the cache, but we still have to read into it. But once it's cached, we no longer have that problem. And now if we go back to the latency graph, now I have the blue is the provisioned and the orange is the serverless. And we see a dramatic difference after the initial spike, right? We see that we're almost uh, an order of magnitude difference. I mean, it turns out it's 8x, right? So this is the kind of thing if you're running serverless, you don't have to worry about. Like if someone just accidentally throws a query on that needs a lot more buffer cache, we're going to be able to accommodate that and just burst up, right? So how does this work on the back end, right? So in serverless, by default, 75% of the memory is to the cache, and then 25% is for processes and everything else. Um, and we can grow and shrink the normal buffers that both InnoDB and Postgres use. So as you go through and you do a bunch of reads, right, that's going to keep that portion of the cache hot, right? So that's, you know, that's the normal behavior. But when you start reading some stuff that isn't in cache, right, we'll actually, if that happens for enough time, we'll, we'll actually make a bigger cache, right? Like we'll enlarge the cache. Those will be read in. And now you have a bigger cache. You're satisfying, you know, that burst like we had on the batch job, right? So that's great. But I don't want to pay for that forever, right? Like once the batch job is done, I want us to be looking at how cold the memory is on the far side, right, where it's not as hot. So as that slowly cools down, we're going to be able to say, hey, we can actually evict those pages, resize the cache, which then will shrink it, and then we'll shrink the overall ACUs that you're running, right? So in this way, we can move up and down really dramatically. So you know, as much as serverless is great at CPU scaling, I actually think the buffer uh, scaling is actually the cooler piece of technology that we have in it. So one of the other manageability efforts that we've been doing over the last couple of years is working um, you know, to provide more statistics and more uh, events that you can view for RDS and Aurora. So Performance Insights, which I was just showing, is a great tool, but there's a lot of data, right? There's all the statistics that you can run from enhanced metrics. There's all the CloudWatch metrics. And our customer said, hey, we'd really like something that helps us with that, right? So what we did was, we started this uh, new piece of our service called DevOps Guru for RDS. And this is an add-in to the current DevOps Guru Center. And what it is is it's machine learning analysis to look for things that are going odd with your performance, with your, could be causing operational issues. So we launched this last year, and it's, it's a really nice feature because it can find things for you very quickly that you didn't know were happening, right? And instead of trying to set all these alarms and do stuff and then have to have false alarms, you can just rely on DevOps Guru for RDS for this. So what it does is it looks at you know, all the data we have that's coming out of the system, and it looks for anomalies, right? So it'll see something like a spike here, and it'll say, that's odd. Um, it'll look at the anomaly and figure out why it's odd. And this is all done through machine learning. So then, then it captures, hey, what were the wait events? What were the locks? What were the SQL statements? What's the CPU and memory like, right? So you have a full picture of what's going on at that time to give you a much more informed uh, information about what you can do then to fix it. And we've actually spent a lot of time working to give really good information on saying, if you see this wait event, here would be the things you would go and look at to change, right? And this is just an example when I was running some benchmarks and I had DevOps Guru turned on. Um, you can see it highlighting in the PI console that I have a point where um, it noticed an anomaly because I was doing a 62 times the normal load for this database. And that was because I was doing benchmarking on a database that I had left idle for you know, a number of days. So it was like, this is, this is quite a change, right? Now, that was well received by our customers. And they said, this is really great. Are there other places you can use machine learning to help us cut through all this data we have to look at? So again, this week, we've introduced a new piece for guard duty called RDS protection. And this is really around looking at the connection information and looking for suspicious login uh, attempts happening to your database, right? And again, with guard duty, you can turn this on with one click, and you can get this feature that allows you to say, is someone trying to do something suspicious? 
logging into one of my databases. So how does this work? You have your Aurora instance, you've enabled guard duty, then you get guard duty RDS protection. What we're gonna do is we're gonna collect connection information, summarize connection information from that instance in real time, and we send that off to our analysis to basically try to detect this information, and then once we see an anomaly, we'll forward that to guard duty, and then it gets put in with all the other information that guard duty is collecting to say, here are the things that could be happening across all of your databases. And then we'll actually give you an explanation of what we've seen so that you have a full understanding of what was detected and most importantly, what you can do to remediate it. Because in the end, when it comes to security, it's not just enough to know, right? You have to be able to quickly fix it. So let's dive into how we detect that suspicious activity. This is an example of a Postgres connection log. Hopefully you can see that. Um, there's a lot of detail, right? And there's, if you've got a lot of connections happening, you could have millions of lines of this a day, right? And looking through that, trying to have something parsing that, that's really difficult. What we're doing is, we are doing that with the machine learning, and we're looking at anomalous lines, right? We're looking for things that look odd to us. Whether it's the IP address you're coming from, let's say it's different, the user, the database, um, that if you're getting error codes, like you're getting failures of logins, um, that the program you're using, let's say normally no one's allowed to use psql. Wait, someone's connecting with psql. What's going on here, right? Um, or that they've forgotten to turn SSL on, but you know it's mandated that that's supposed to be the way you do it. So those would all be things that we'd sort of notice. Now to show this in action, we actually had our security experts build a lot of tests to exercise this whole system, right? So one of the tests they built was a brute force dictionary attack, you know, against a, a set of accounts. And guard duty can totally see this coming, right? It can detect that that's happening and that someone's trying to brute force into, uh, into your instance. Um, probably a slightly more complicated case is where you have a valid credential, but it's been stolen by someone. So now you have to detect that it's being used in an odd way, like it's coming from an odd place, an odd application, and you know, really figure out that that's, that's not normal. And again, we can detect that. Also, if you know, things are coming from odd locations like outside of your VPC or someone's scanning all your databases, right? Um, trying to enumerate them. You would notice these kind of things, right? So once we detect this, the kind of uh, uh, actions that you can take, an example, if you've got something coming in from outside, then it's like, well, wait, that's not supposed to be happening we'll give you the instructions on how to close those holes so that you no longer have those openings, right? If we think there's a, a stolen credential, we will show you that you need to re rotate that key, right, to block that user from coming in. And we'll also point you at the other logs and information to go do other deep analysis for other you know, things that could be happening from a security basis. So it's a really nice feature that allows you to get that, all that value with just you know, one click. The other one that we, around manageability, that we announced this week is our blue-green deployments. So initially this is for RDS MySQL and Aurora MySQL, but we plan to bring it to the other engines uh, uh, hopefully soon. Um, what this is is allowing you to make changes to um, your system with less downtime. And let's walk through that. So you have your normal Aurora MySQL cluster. It's running 2.10.2, which is the 5.7 version. And Let's say you want to go and upgrade it or make a change. You can just create a blue-green deployment. And what's that going to do? Well, that's going to make essentially a copy of your current system. And you'll notice it matches, right? Like it has all the same number of instances. Even if you have a smaller instance, it's going to match that up exactly. And it creates a target, which is you know, the same name as I had with the word green on it and some extra little bits to make sure it's unique. Um, and you'll notice that the initial version is the same version, right? It is 2.10.2. Now, you have, a lot, you have a bunch of options here. Now, you can use the blue-green to do things like major and minor upgrades, which you can do as part of the actual command here, and we'll show that. But you could also do schema changes on your green environment. You could use this to build some new indexes or do other changes, alter your tables. You can do maintenance actions. So anything that you'd want to do sort of that would, might cause disruption to your production system, you can now do to your green, and then we can flip to it. So, I've asked for this green deployment to be upgraded to our 8.0 compatible version. So it's going to go do that in the background. And once that's done, 
it will start replicating, and it uses bin log replication for MySQL. So you have to have that turned on for your cluster. So again, good thing we have that enhanced bin log that, that is less, uh, less impactful, right? So once you turn that on, and it gets caught up, and it, remember, it's asynchronous, so it's not going to be in sync, but it'll be close, right? Um, then the system is available to now be failed over to. So then we can call the switchover command. And the switchover is going to do a couple of things. One, you'll start seeing that switchover is in progress on the deployment. And we'll validate the configuration. We'll make sure everything's working OK, right? Like, so you don't want to have one of these nodes down or having some problem, right? You want it to all be available. And we need to make sure that the replication is mostly caught up. You wouldn't want it to be two hours behind, right? You want it to be a couple seconds behind. When that's all in that state, then what we're going to do is we're going to block the writes coming in. So once the writes are blocked, you know, nothing can change. We let the replication catch up. Once that's all done, then we actually do the switch over, right? So at this point, we're changing the DNS and entries. So now your application can connect to the new database. And you'll notice that the names have all changed. So even inside of RDS and the Aurora console, what you will see is you don't have to like map any of your scripts because all the names are exactly as they were for all the instances, all the cluster, and everything, right? So we've done all that stuff. The endpoint, everything gets renamed. At this point, you're essentially done. But you still have a blue-green deployment, um, so you want to clean that up by deleting it. And what, that just basically disassociates these two clusters, right? But we leave the, initial, the original cluster there in case you want to do any customer verification, right? And once you're done that, you can then remove everything, right? So in this way, you know, it's not dramatic. You, you, know, you do have time to, to do any kind of verification you want. But in the end, you end up with a cluster that's been upgraded, but now it looks exactly the same as what you started with. So this is very handy. Now, you could do all this yourself, but it's a lot of workflow, right? It's a lot of steps. To get, to get really right. And we, you know, we thought this would be a really good addition. The other one that we announced this, uh, this week was some new stuff around Redshift integration. And I want to talk about why that's important. So obviously, Aurora, you know, very good OLTP database. You can use it for some light decision support. But if you're really doing a lot of data warehousing, you want to be doing using Redshift, right? So if you have those two things, you have to figure out how to get your analytic, you know, your data to your analytic system. Well, you can build, you know, a pipeline that does this. You can use, you know, export to get to S3. You can use DMS to replicate the changes. This is all very possible today, and it's, you know, it's not too bad. But you have to maintain and run this system, right? So that's a lot of stuff to manage. But instead, what you can do is you can now use the zero ETL integration that we have. So this integration just replaces all that and is a one-click solution to get the exact same benefits that you would have gotten of building your own ETL system. And the nice thing is, it's very low lag. And, and we'll talk about why that's possible. Um, the, the main piece of this is that you're, sim you're separating, oh, sorry, you're simplifying the whole process and making it much smaller, right? Which means it's faster. And, it, and it's more capable. So because you don't have to actually do all the ETL, it's much quicker to also, when you have new information coming in, you don't have to set up a new ETL process. You can just set up a new integration. So what we've done here is we do initial seeding, and then we do continuous replication. So this means that the replication is sub 10 seconds. And it doesn't have to pause. So you can continue to run queries on your Redshift while you're doing all your OLTP work, right? So that's, that's, uh, that's essentially what you get. Now, one of the other nice things is you can collapse many Aurora databases into one Redshift database. So this example, a customer has like 70 plus Aurora instances. They have uh, you know, a ton of transactions. They have this requirement to replicate very quickly, a lot of tables, a lot of rows. We can set up multiple integrations. Each one of those is just you add an integration for each of your Aurora instances to Redshift. And then once Redshift is there, you have all the power of Redshift, right, to go do analytics. So in this way, you know, again, you could do this today, but it would take a lot more effort to do that. So we're very happy with this feature. Now, part of the improvement comes here on how we do the storage to storage based uh, integration. So with Aurora, what we have is our storage that is taking both the transaction log 
and the change data capture log. And that's, of course, the bin log, right, as we talked about before. So the first thing we need to do is we need to seed Redshift with the initial data. So we do that by doing that parallel direct export that I talked about earlier. So this is very fast, can move a lot, move terabytes very, very quickly, right? And then once that's done, what we need to do is we need to you know, have the continuous feed. So this is where the enhanced bin log comes in. And we can feed this directly from storage to a CDC streaming service that will then put it into Redshift, right? So at that point, you have this thing that's keeping up. And the nice thing is with this system is, even if you're making schema changes or other changes to your Aurora system, we will either make those, flow those changes through, and when that's not possible, we'll reseed the data. So even if you make things that normally wouldn't work through an ETL process, we will redo those, uh, those processes. So that's all I have on this. It's a, it's a really good feature. Now, if you want more information on a few of the things I talked about, there's a number of sessions that uh, cover those in more detail. Uh, and you can, uh, some of them have happened, but there's, there'll be videos for all of the different uh, sessions, so you can, you can check out some more detail on that. And uh, with that, I'll end my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Okay.